You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is another episode about investing, and what I wanted to do today is to really provide a kind of overview of how I got into investing and what I think the major questions are that uh, everyone faces when getting into investing, or at least the ones that I faced. Um, so uh, this is from my background um, as an entrepreneur um, who then sold his business and wanted to invest the money, and I had no uh, investment training no family background in investment, no real idea about um, investing at all. So I think there were a number of big questions that um, that I had to try and get my head around uh, in getting involved in investing, which uh, hopefully talking about will be helpful. So to start off, I guess the first question is really why invest in the first place? And I did definitely hear a perspective um that I remember very well that was useful in thinking about this, which was um, a guy who was kind of a mentor to me when I was a, an entrepreneur, a very successful lawyer, had his own business. Um, and he said that he had just decided to forget about investment. He just put his money in the bank. Um, and his perspective was that he got on with earning money because that's what he was really specialist at was his, his own business. Um, so he figured that he could make a better return just spending his time concentrating on earning money and not um you know wasting his time on something risky like trying to invest in different markets and so forth and i know that he also gave his money to an investment manager who made bad decisions with it and so forth and i can i can really understand that perspective although it is also worth saying that when he was saying that was in the 1990s um, and that was a time when the interest rate was actually above inflation. So real interest, you could actually earn real interest uh, on your money in the bank. And uh, you can't even do that now, really. Um, and I think there are another, a number of other reasons why it isn't really possible just to put your money in the bank and forget about it. I guess the first things that occurred to me were really the dangers with that. Um, inflation is the key danger that, you know, you, you might spend all your time earning all this money through your entrepreneurship, then you put it in the bank, and it doesn't earn interest above inflation, and so your money just basically uh, whittles away um, every year through uh, the loss in purchasing power that comes with inflation. The other problem um, that concerned me is counterparty risk that you you know the banks might fail, and uh, we've seen a few of a few banks fail in the uh, period since um, the Great Recession started in two thousand and eight. Um, in Western countries, governments have mainly sort of stepped in and propped them up, but you know who knows how long that could go on for, and it might there might be another round of those kind of failures. So I guess those are the sort of the fear element in the marketplace um, that I guess is one uh, motivation for investing uh, because of the dangers. The other side is the opportunities that I guess once you've earned all of this money through entrepreneurship, you want to get the money to work for you because the goal in the end, at least the goal for me, was to get to a point of having passive income where having sold my business, I wanted to be able to you know, get passive income from my investments um, and, and that really is what provides financial freedom. And that's the opportunity. Um, and of course, in order to realize that opportunity, you need to look beyond just putting money in a bank because each era has an asset class that's going to pay significantly more than just putting money in a bank account would. And for example, in the 1990s, it was stocks. And stocks were, in some years, earning 25%. Um, in the 2000s, it wasn't stocks anymore, it was gold, and that, again, was earning above 20% in some years. Who knows what it'll be, um, looking back um, on this decade, um, when we come to, to be able to look back on it. It's, you can't tell in advance, but there is this opportunity to get um, your money working for you. And I guess that's the greed element of the marketplace, und underlying the kind of motivations for investment. But I think it's really about the opportunity to, to get passive income. That was the thoughts that I had 
in in why I wanted to invest the money that I had made through selling my business. I guess the next big question that you faced is who's going to make the decisions about your investment? And that really is the question of whether or not you get others to manage your investments for you or you manage it yourself. And when I sold my business, I actually met with a bunch of asset managers and private banks and people and asked them about what they could do for me. And I found that whole experience to be very unsettling. I didn't really understand exactly how they were making decisions and I couldn't really get a clear sense of what they were going to do with my money. Um, so I very much was against handing over my money to somebody else. There's also the cost factor involved. If you if you do give your portfolio to somebody else to manage, they're going to take maybe one or two or maybe even three percent of your portfolio um, as their uh, fee every year, whether or not you make profit or not. And given that you might only end up making one or two or three or four percent, that can wipe out any gain that you you actually make. So I was concerned that that, you know, that also seemed like a very expensive option. Um, so I decided to go for managing my investments myself. And really the, the, the person that um, most influenced me in this was Harry Brown. I listened to all of his um, podcasts, his online radio show podcasts about investment and his approach of really not trusting somebody else to do your investments for you and not doing anything that you don't understand. Um, I, I found that to be uh, really in line with my own thinking and I really appreciated his perspective on that. And I figured that it, ultimately, if I'm not going to do anything that I don't understand, then if I were to get somebody else to manage my money for me, I'd have to understand what they were doing. And if I understood it, well, I might as well just do it myself. So that was sort of how um, how I came to the view of, of managing uh, my own investments. And I think there's also an underlying element of having the kind of independence and, and personal responsibility involved that, that very much fits in with the, all of the other aspects that we talked about on The Voluntary Life. The next major question um, in investing is how you're going to invest. And I guess the two different approaches here would to be either to be a pa an active investor or a passive investor. Active investors are those who choose stocks based on some kind of fundamental criteria that they look up. I mean, there's books like, uh, like The Intelligent Investor by uh, Benjamin Graham, who wrote this book in the 1940s, which is all about how you're supposed to look at the fundamentals of a company and work out whether or not its stock is undervalued and so forth. And active investment involves doing this kind of thing every day. You know, you're looking at the financial pages and you're looking at different stocks and things and and really, um, investment becomes like a second job um, that you you're supposed to sort of keep an eye on all of these different indices and uh, look at the kind of moving averages of of your assets over months and so forth. And to me, that that just sounded like a hell of a lot of work. And it also sounded like a lot like a lot of work in in an area where. Uh, you can't really predict any of this stuff anyway. So you might think that you're on some kind of trend, but uh, and you might put all this work into following moving averages and so forth, and then all of a sudden, you know, the market can crash and you wouldn't have been able to predict it. So I was really not interested in becoming an active investor. I also don't think that I have um, anything like the skill to to really look at all of these different um, indices. And frankly, I don't know who would have the skill to really uh, be able to beat the market um, in that way. But if anyone who does have the skill, I think they still have to make it really a full-time job in order to make it work. I was much more interested in the idea of, of passive investing. And again, this is um, because I was influenced by Harry Brown, but the idea is just that really to embrace the uncertainty and accept the fact that you can't predict the markets except at a very strategic level. You know, you can't know what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. You can just know some broad things about, you know, what 
different assets might do in different economic conditions um, based on fundamental economic theory. And so the idea is that you, you make a strategy based on your sort of fundamental understanding of the economy and then you implement the strategy and you just forget about it. You don't try and work out these uh, sort of individual active interventions in your portfolio you just follow a strategy and get on with it um, get on with the rest of your life basically and that very much more appealed to me so I got involved in in passive investing I think there's could be more to say about um, uh, passive investing in another podcast but um, in this one I'll just go over the main the main questions so I guess the next question is what are you actually going to invest in and there are a couple of ways of thinking about what to invest in. Um, the, the, the way that this is talked about in the investment world is asset allocation and security selection. So asset allocation is the question of what types of assets are you actually going to invest in? In other words, are you going to invest in stocks? Are you going to invest in bonds? Are you going to invest in precious metals? These are all very different types of asset. And this is where um, the real diversification of an investment portfolio comes. So in other words, if you invest in very different types of things, then if the market changes suddenly, then it will positively impact probably one of your assets at the same time as negatively impacting another, in which case you, you've kind of hedged that risk a bit. So in other words, you won't, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. You're allocating your assets into different classes. And I was very much um, uh, influenced by the permanent portfolio approach, which is to be very well diversified for protection against risk, to have your portfolio split between very different types of assets so that you are covered whatever happens in the economy. In the permanent portfolio approach, that's 25% each in stocks, long-term bonds, cash and physical gold bullion. The other question about what to invest in is the question of security selection. And that is the individual funds that you go into. So, for example, say you want to invest in stocks. Well, which actual stocks are you going to, to buy? So asset allocation would be stocks versus bonds. Security selection would be, well, which stocks and which bonds? And this, again, is uh, where a lot of um, investment writing focuses on this question which particular stocks or bonds to buy as opposed to the sort of higher level question of what your asset allocation mix is um, and it, that sort of seemed always seemed to me a bit to not see the woods for the trees but I, I was again influenced by the ideas that Harry Brown talks about with the permanent portfolio which is that you can't really predict individual stocks and and so forth so it's it's best to take a very much uh, broad passive investing approach, which which involves using things like index funds, where rather than try and pick individual stocks, you just use a fund of stocks that, that covers the entire stock market so that if the market rises, you benefit from the overall rise, but you don't have to worry about whether or not you pick the individual correct stocks. This is one area where um, I actually think that... Um, my skill set is not well suited because in picking things like funds and stocks and where you hold these things, a really, really key question is cost. And you need to look at things like the expense ratios of the funds that you hold and the platform that you hold those funds on and whether there are costs involved. And there's a lot of opportunity to, to really save money in doing these kinds of things. And it's a very detail-oriented question. So, And it will obviously differ from country to country as well. But that's where I think this, this question of security selection is really important, is looking at your individual costs. Another key question about investment is when to invest. And... There are a number of ways of, of looking at that question. I guess one question, when in terms of your your own um, financial development should you invest? And uh, in relation to the other podcasts that I've done on financial freedom, as I've talked about before, I think there's not much point in getting involved in complicated questions of investment until you really built up that emergency fund and that one year of, of, uh, of living expenses. I, I invested once. I'd sold my company. So I came into uh, a load of cash all of a sudden at once and I already had a year of um, 
uh, living expenses saved up. That's the point, I think, in which it makes sense to start looking at how you protect yourself against some of these risks and take advantage of some of these opportunities of passive and full passive income that come from investing. But there's another question involved in when to invest, and that's really the question of market timing. Um, are you going to try and buy and sell at different assets at specific times in order to take advantage of assets that are going up and and to not be caught out of assets that are going down. And again, this this is a bit like what I was saying about the active investing um, question. Market timing is one of those things that if you think that you can do market timing, you have to spend a whole lot of time looking at uh, moving averages and trying to work out what trend lines are doing. And at the end of the day, uh, you can't actually predict the market anyway. So it seemed to me like... Um, it would just be fooling myself to think that I could time the market. Um, nobody can predict the market. Uh, you can maybe get lucky by following a trend, but trend there's no guarantee the trends are going to continue. So I was much more interested in the idea of just not trying to time the market and to go for a, a, a strategy of automatically rebalancing my portfolio. Now, the idea with that is that rather than trying to work out when is a good time to buy and sell? You just hold a fixed amount of your portfolio in each asset class. And then when one asset class starts to really rise in value so that it becomes a much larger percentage of your portfolio, say, for example, you held 25% of gold, but the gold uh, uh, bullion rises in value until it suddenly is 35% of your gold, then you sell in order to rebalance your portfolio back to 25% and to have the same mix of assets that you originally have in your strategy. The great thing that appealed to me about that is that it's a method of automatically selling when prices are high and buying when prices are cheap. And you don't have to worry about trying to predict the market. So that just made a whole lot more sense to me. Again, that comes from the, the permanent portfolio approach. So um, I just simply implemented that approach. And that seemed to me a lot more realistic than trying to time the market. I guess another question for investing is where to invest. And this, uh, you know, there are different views about geographic diversification. Should you invest in your own country or should you put your investments abroad? Um, and if so, where should you put them and so forth? And I guess there's a lot more that could be said about this in more detail. I just went with um, the advice that Harry Brown gives, which is mainly to focus on the country that you're earning your money in and to hedge against risk in, in your own currency, but to also hold some uh, of your assets abroad in case weird things happen, um, unexpected events, major economic meltdown in your own country or, or some other event, which means that you always have some of your portfolio outside your country of origin. And and that was the the... Um, the approach that I went with Harry Brown recommends that being the gold bullion part of your portfolio um, uh, because that's really the, your, your most tangible physical asset so that's um, that's the approach that I've taken to so I'm, I'm sure there could be a lot more said about all of these questions um, and I may do additional podcasts looking more specifically at the individual uh, questions involved in investing but I thought that would give uh, a brief overview again this is just my experience I'm I'm not a professional financial advisor or any kind of financial advisor and this isn't investment advice um, it's up to you to what you do with your money and, and you will need to do your own research but I hope that my experience is helpful and thanks so much for listening thank you for listening to the voluntary life if you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.